Hi, thanks for joining me today. Um, I'm excited to share with you this topic, uh, the role of direct air capture and the portfolio of, approach, of approaches to meeting climate goals. Um, and this first slide, what I'm going to do is try and get us all on the same page. And so what this is showing is annual emissions on the order of about 40 gigatons of CO2 per year. And you see two different trajectories. Uh, there's a business as usual trajectory, which is the yellow line at the top. Uh, and then there's also the trajectory that shows us reaching climate goals or achieving, um, avoiding negative 2C warming by 2100. And this, you know, this work, in addition to a number of recent climate studies, um, including IPCC, uh, recent carbon removal studies coming out of uh, the Royal Society on greenhouse greenhouse gas removal, and also a recent study from the Academy of Sciences that was released in 2019, all discuss the fact that uh, deep decarbonization to achieving climate goals is no longer enough, and that we also need to be removing CO2 from the atmosphere as well. Uh, more specifically, uh, this is a conclusion from the study from the Academy of Sciences and Engineering, which I was a co-author on. Uh, and what we concluded from this study is that negative emissions on the order of about 10 gigatons of CO2 per year by mid-century, and then 20 gigatons of CO2 per year removal by century's end will be required uh, to meet climate goals. And again, this was a, a report that came out around the same time as a number of other reports, like the IPCC report um, for the one and a half degree scenario, and also a greenhouse gas removal report that came out of the Royal Society. And all reports are pretty consistent that negative emissions will have to play a significant role in addition to deep decarbonization in order to meet climate goals. Uh, so to just give you a little bit of an overview of the different approaches. And so showing here coastal blue carbon, um, accelerated chemical weathering of rocks. And so in Earth's crust, uh, there's um, certain minerals that are rich in calcium and magnesium that readily react with CO2 from the atmosphere. So there's active research being done about how to accelerate the reactivity of CO2 with those, with those minerals in the earth. Um, direct air capture with chemicals. So I'm gonna dive deeper into this topic and talk about this today. Um, but this is using reactive chemicals in order to selectively um, remove through the reaction with CO2 in the atmosphere. And you can see here that it requires fans, it requires very high contact areas. Um, and then you can also see biomass energy uh, coupled to carbon capture and storage. When we looked at this in the Academy Sciences report, we considered only waste biomass uh, in terms of technical potential of this approach and the impact. Both with direct air capture and with biomass energy coupled to carbon capture uh, require a storage uh, in addition to the actual removal of CO2. So dedicated geologic storage of CO2. Here we give examples of sedimentary basins and also um, basalt formations deep in the earth. Uh, there's also afforestation and reforestation. Um, and then finally, soil carbon storage. So enhancing um, the storage of CO2 or carbon uh, in soils. So what is direct air capture? Again, it's, it's using chemicals to remove CO2 from the atmosphere. It's important to keep in mind, um, there are both pros and cons to doing this. Capturing CO2 from the atmosphere provided that it's coupled with permanent storage of CO2 has the potential to be a negative emission strategy. Um, it's also a method to helping to deal, of course, with difficult to avoid emissions, such as those from the agricultural sector, uh, transportation, and the industrial sector. It does not require arable land. So when you're building these kinds of contactors, you don't have to worry about um, competing, for instance, with, with food and growing food. Uh, the cons are significant. The energy inputs are very high for doing this uh, due to the concentrations in the atmosphere being uh, you know, 100 to 300 times more dilute than they are from a power plant or a point source. The land footprint is still pretty significant. Uh, it can be large and it also depends on what type of energy you're coupling to it. Um, one thing I'll mention is, is that there's a common misconception of the water needs for this system. There are multiple technologies out there for direct air capture. We'll talk about a couple here today. One does require water, but another one is a net producer of water. So depending on what technology you use for direct air capture, not all have uh, water requirements. 
And then this is just taking a little bit of a closer look at the energy, a little bit technical, uh, combines the first and second laws of thermodynamics to just show that you can calculate the minimum energy or the minimum work required to do a separation. And all this is showing is if you notice along the x-axis, as you move from right to left, you're getting to gas mixtures that are more and more dilute in CO2. So we go from point sources all the way to the atmosphere. And then what you find is that as you get to systems that are more and more dilute, the minimum thermodynamic work for separation significantly increases. And so what we can say here is that roughly speaking from a minimum work perspective, um, so the best that you could possibly do, it's still gonna be three times more energy intensive to capture CO2 from air compared to point sources. And then because the dilution is so significant in the atmosphere compared to point sources, you're gonna need surface areas or contact areas of, of your systems that are roughly 100 to 300 times greater than point sources. And so this is just an important consideration to emphasize that carbon removal should never be a replacement, and certainly not direct air capture, for just avoiding the CO2 emissions to begin with. So what I wanted to show here is really just showing briefly the difference between um, point source capture and capture CO2 from, this, from the atmosphere. And so this is what a scrubber looks like. This is um, a system that's, that's at the Petronova power plant. Um, the CO2 that they were capturing from this power plant is about 1.4 million tons of CO2 per year. It was used, um, the CO2 was then transported for enhanced oil recovery to ultimately store the CO2 in the earth, but at the same time recovering oil from the earth and using CO2 to enhance that process. And so what you notice from this contactor is how it's tall and thin. And what I want to point out is that at the bottom, when your air is coming in or your gas stream is coming in and you're moving up the horizontal bars that you see, you're essentially scrubbing the CO2 out of the gas stream so that it comes out of the top being pretty free of CO2. And then you have a, a solution that goes down the packing material and is becoming more and more saturated with CO2 as it's reacting with CO2 from the gas stream. And so you notice here that these, these contactors for contactors for uh, point source capture tend to be tall and thin. But when you look at the atmosphere, because it's so dilute, the CO2, in order to capture the equivalent CO2, you need a lot of these very large um, contact area, cross-sectional area contactors. To capture a million tons of CO2 per year, you need 10 of these units compared to the single unit that you saw in the previous slide. Um, what you also notice about this contactor is the depth. And so that depth um, is actually pretty, pretty thin comparison to, compared to the tall tower that you saw previously. And that's because it takes power and energy in order to push the air through. So the thinner that bed, the less CO2 you capture, but also the less energy you spend on fan power. And so from, from point sources, you, you scrub a lot more CO2 where these are optimized and don't capture as much of the CO2 from the air. Uh, the two different leading technologies today are based on liquid solvents where you have a structured packing material that goes inside. And then the second type of material is a solid sorbent material where you have these honeycomb structures that look pretty similar to um, the con or look pretty similar to the catalytic converter in your automobile. And so in that case, what happens is your micro mesoporous material, which has all of the chemistry on it, is embedded within the walls of that structure. And that micro mesoporous material has very high surface area, just a gram of it has the surface area of a football field, which means you have a lot of contact area to interact with CO2. Um, and so the bottom one is the one in which is a net producer of water because it captures from air both water and CO2 in that unit. And so when you go to regenerate it and add heat to the system, you ultimately are generating water vapor as well. So one thing to keep in mind is going back to the energy to design one of these plants, you also need to think about what is the power plant that's going to be coupled to it. And so Roughly speaking, just as a kind of an order of magnitude estimate, if you want to capture a million tons of CO2 um, per year from the atmosphere, it requires a power plant on the order of about 300 to 500 megawatts, again, depending on what kind of energy you couple. Uh, so this is pretty significant, but what I want to point out is not to fall into the trap of saying, okay, if I want to capture a gigaton, I need to multiply that power times a thousand. The important thing to keep in mind is that the energy distribution of direct air captures today is about 80% thermal and 20% electric to run the fans and the pumps. And so there's a lot of ways to make heat. 
and it doesn't always come from resistive feeding, say from electrons. And so this is a report um, or some details that came out of a, a report that came out of Lawrence Livermore National Lab um, last year, which was looking at a pathway to achieving carbon neutrality by 2045. And so in my group, we looked at uh, scenarios where if we couple CO2, if we couple direct air capture with existing energy infrastructure. So specifically what we looked at is geothermal, so low carbon energy that was already developed in some cases in um, Southern California, you see here um, in different regions. And then we also looked at uh, where waste heat was available from industrial sources. And it turns out that when you couple to existing energy infrastructure, you can reduce the cost significantly. Today, the reported costs of direct air capture um, are roughly anywhere from you know, $300 to $600 per ton uh, in terms of actually projects on the ground that are taking place today, for instance, through a company called Climeworks. Uh, but what we're showing is if you couple to existing energy infrastructure, it can significantly reduce the capital expense or the capex of your system. And so uh, ultimately, you can achieve lower costs in doing this. Uh, we have another study that we published in the Environmental Science and Technology Journal just this past spring, where we do it across the whole U.S. and we look at examples of coupling to nuclear, and we also look at examples of geothermal, and specifically trying to look at regions where there's pipeline infrastructure available for CO2 in the Carmine Basin and in the Gulf Coast. And so what we see is that we, are, we see opportunities for even less than $200 a ton, in a lot of cases $300 a ton. So the incentives to do um, carbon capture today, there are some policy incentives in place. Um, it turns out, first we have to think about how is CO2 used today already? Um, the market is about 80 million tons of CO2 per year, with the largest sector being using CO2 for enhanced oil recovery in the earth. Now, most of the CO2 that's used for EOR is actually naturally sourced from the earth. In fact, 85% of it is. Um, and so the, the price is that one would be willing to pay to do that is anywhere between four to forty dollars per ton of CO2. And it depends heavily on the price of oil, uh, which is what they're ultimately um, generating from the process. And so this is one of the reasons why the Petronova project uh, closed recently in the Permian Basin is because the price of oil got to be so low, not that the carbon capture technology uh, wasn't working properly. And in fact, works just fine. Uh, it's just that this is one reason I think that policy shouldn't necessarily uh, be uh, developed such that carbon capture is tied to enhanced oil recovery um, because that means that it's also impacted by the price of oil. And so looking at opportunities where you can couple CO2 capture with dedicated geologic storage is something that will actually help the, you know, the, the industry in the future. So the other options are there's also the California Low Carbon Fuel Standard which is trading up to $180 to $200 per ton of CO2. And direct air capture qualifies for that. So that has to do with the fact that the transportation sector is very difficult um, to avoid emissions from. And so if you build a power plant anywhere in the United States, that, or if you build a direct air capture plant anywhere in the United States and you permanently remove the CO2 from the atmosphere through dedicated storage, you can earn that credit through the state of California. There's also a 45Q. Uh, which is a federal tax credit, which maxes out for enhanced oil recovery or utilization at $35 a ton, and then dedicated storage maxing out at about $50 a ton. And there's, there's discussions about increasing that gap so that, again, so that you can have um, carbon capture industry kind of moving forward without being so coupled to um, the utilization industry. There's emerging markets as well, um, like so, for instance, looking at construction. Uh, and, and looking at concrete and CO2 uh, being used in terms of synthetic aggregates for sand and gravel replacement for, for concrete, and also for fuels. The difficulty with fuels is that you, they, they um, are very short-lived, and so you ultimately oxidize the fuel and the CO2 ends up going back into the atmosphere. Uh, so finally, I just want to end on this slide, uh, just bringing us back to the beginning to show that um, the portfolio of solutions our deep decarbonization first and foremost, but now to meet climate goals, we also need to do carbon removal at significant scales, where direct air capture is really just one of a variety of approaches that will be required um, to achieve climate goals. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions.